So something that we we keep ourselves technical with uh, in this forum as technical leaders. If there's projects going on within your company, something interesting, or you've read a research paper and you can recruit that researcher in to give the talk, uh, all things that we've done in the past to, to have some interesting technical discussions here. And so volunteering today from Google is, is Diana, and I will let you uh, reintroduce yourself and what you're going to talk about today. I'm going out oh, there. Good. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Y'all see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Deanna Glaze. I work in the Confidential VM team at Google uh, with Catherine, and I've been working for the past couple years on uh, our posture for making uh, the trusted computing base that we put into guest computing contexts uh, much more transparent and trustworthy. And uh, I've done a good amount of philosophizing about that that I'm going to uh, proselytize y'all with today. Uh, now I said, or uh, Dan said uh, UEFI, I'm going to be saying UFI. Um, and I like to use pictures. So here we go. Um, I don't know if this outline is correct, but it's roughly correct. I'm going to just jump in. Uh, so baseline context, uh, I work with confidential VMs in Google Compute Engine. Uh, and confidential VMs are in use um, on uh, AMD and Intel hardware with 7SMP and TDX. Uh, and we're working on a, a fully, you know, we have a, a, a full workload attestation chain um, product called Confidential Space, um, but uh, we control the entire chain there. Um, it does have some limitations that are being um, gradually broken down. Uh, and it so a little bit about confidential space. The UEFI, the attested container optimized operating system, the workload launcher, and the service that does the verification of attestations is all done uh, by Google. So it's not. Um, what a lot of customers are, would like to see when they read about the, the threat model and the security model for uh, AMD 7SMB and Intel TDX. So in confidential VMs, I'm going to be talking specifically about just making the UEFI uh, verifiable by anyone. Um, everything else involves a lot of other software projects um, and build systems internally that uh, I don't have as much context uh, on, but I am working with the teams in order to, to push us towards this goal, but just do it if I today. All right, so I, I think folks have seen the rats diagram, um, but for us, the reference value provider, the reference values that we, we just are saying that the digest that you get from uh, a quote is the one that you want to see. And to me, that's not particularly satisfying. Um, but, you know, when you have uh, signed packages, really, you're just getting a signature of the digest. So folks tend to be okay with that. The certificates give the um, the, the vendor information to, to track back. So it's not particularly bad, but I'm idealistic. So I think that this is about as transparent as a brick. Um, and so transparency is a, a, an English word that we haven't really nailed down. Um, and I think that reference values uh, and transparency of those reference values are two different things. And uh, they are going to be presented into the attestation framework uh, as two different things. And I'll talk about that. All right, so and, um, in terms- Diana, I hate to interrupt, but I, I mm -hmm. forgot to ask beforehand, would you like to take questions and uh, during the talk or, or ask people to wait to the end? Uh, I'll take questions during the talk, that's fine. 
Uh, do you have a question? <laughs> yes, I wanted to, to check your uh, digging a little bit on, on the idea of transparency as an endorsement, uh, as opposed to having direct access to the source to reproduce the reference value. Uh, yes. So I think that uh, you do need that, and I'll get to that. But in a runtime system, when you're trying to check out of stations, you're not going to run a whole build. And that's that's kind of uh, where you need someone to say, oh, yeah, that that did happen. I you, it is good. Um, and we'll we'll get to that. OK. Thank you. All right. So uh, folks haven't been seeing reference values with signatures. Um, our firmware is within the, the major mono repo that there have been talks about. Um, the sub modules that EDK2 has all internally vendored all in the, the mono repo. The build system that every project uh, uses at Google to push things into production is also what's used to build the firmware. Um, that tool chain is not particularly accessible from outside Google infrastructure. Uh, it produces uh, what's called BCID, the Borg um, uh, code identity um, system. And the Borg code identity is being exported as a new, uh, new format called Salsa. Uh, folks might have seen Salsa, S-L-A-S-A dot D-E-V, um, has a notion of build provenance that is put into a uh, build attestation uh, in the in toto attestation framework. Right. Um, and then operationally, when you create a VM, you do not get to select what firmware you're using. And our firmware is just bundled within the virtual machine monitor. So whatever is the, the release of the day, um, we have the build of that release being what folks uh, are, are launching. So we try to make maintain continuity of the, of the semantics. Um, and we'll see a little bit why that's um, a bit difficult to work with when you're you're trying to say have a PCR zero that represents the actual bits of your firmware, okay? But um, the thumb, the 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 check mark, uh, you're going to start seeing uh, signed documents uh, that are right now protobuf messages, of course, because Google, uh, and those are rooted back to a an HSM protected key whose root certificate is already on pki.goog right now. All right. Okay. So everything I'm going to talk to talk to you about uh, for now is all just my personal vision. It's not committed roadmap. Uh, everything that has to be done involves a lot of teams uh, and influencing them and getting on their timelines. So. Uh, I'm just going to give a small peek behind the curtain for uh, things that have been discussed publicly and implications of those things. Can, can I ask what the, what the that picture is? For me, that means cryptographic salt, and I suspect that isn't what you mean. I'm saying take this with a shaker of salt. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very nice. Okay. Uh, so I've been barking up this tree for about five years, uh, and it uh, it has been kind of an alignment of planets to make all of this work out. Um, but that uh, it is starting to to look more feasible uh, to to see this vision of a, a fully transparent UEFI, uh, and that's um, what I'd like to talk about uh, today. So here we go. Uh, I think that transparency uh, is a sliding scale. It is not a defined concept from Confidential Computing Consortium. There is an attempt to define transparency as part of the SKIT working group of the IETF, the Supply Chain Integrity Trust, Transparency and Trust Working Group. Uh, I don't think that goes far enough. Um, 
We have our own research project, Project Oak, that is now part of Google DeepMind because uh, they're using confidential computing for AI. And uh, they have this uh, project that is open source on GitHub for transparent releases. Um, so you can go from your GitHub sources, a known tool chain container that is content addressed, uh, and then your build attestation that is in the Intoto build attestation format gets registered into an append only log where there's another open source project, SigStore. SigStore has a public good uh, server that folks have been submitting things to. Um, that server is not going to be, you know, the enterprise scale that folks need um, when this moves up to the, um, the technology du jour, but it is a good proof of concept. Uh, the way that it builds things is it uses GitHub Actions. All right, so the entire thing that, uh, that Project Oak does is what uh, a, a team of Azure um, engineers, including the CTO, published in the communications of the ACM uh, earlier this year. Um, and instead of SigStore, they have the code transparency service, which I haven't seen an open source project for, but it sounds like SigStore. Um, and the Microsoft engineers are working on the, the Skit working group, uh, is my understanding. Do you, have All right. a, do you have a link to the ACM article? Uh, I could, I can get it, but you, you should be able to just um, search, why should I trust your code, NCACM, and get it. Uh, it, is, it is a public article. Yeah, okay. so it, search for what? Trusted code? Why should I trust your code? Okay, okay. NCACM, All right? So this is my baseline. Um, I think that the transparency of transparent releases is necessary, uh, but it is, it is not in itself uh, strong enough to imply security and trustworthiness. We got thousands of people looking at Linux and there are security bugs in it all the time, um, which is everything, but uh, it is leading into um, the add-ons that I'll talk about here. Okay. So my goals um, are starting to align with Google offerings. There is uh, an offering at Google called Assured Open Source. Uh, and there's a new policy that if you have open source binaries that you are shipping out of Google, they have to go through the Assured Open Source pipeline. And there are a lot of, of good checks and balances uh, in this pipeline, all right? So we have Git hosts or a single Git host with multiple repositories um, that is for assured open source. So this is outside of the mono repo. Um, the single host is to you know, maintain quality assurance, make sure that all of the ACLs are, are secure. It's very open SSF scorecard type stuff. All right, uh, and if you want to make uh, your builds use a toolchain container, um, you're going to be basing your containers either as distro lists uh, or based on a couple of different versions of Debian. And we have this artifact error lock, um, basically mirrored uh, package repository for Debian, uh, where we are rebuilding everything from Debian and, and um, double checking the, the build attestations, making sure that everything is, is managed um, uh, securely. And I think that uh, they, they try to make sure that the, the digests of the binaries are exactly the same as what's, what Debian has, but not everything is reproducible. Um, but that is where we're at there. Uh, your tool chain containers can't just be one and done. You have to have them defined in a pipeline uh, that uh, rebuilds periodically. And then there is already a, a, uh, an offering called the artifact analysis, 
um, that when you upload a container, you get uh, software component analysis done uh, against the vulnerability database um, that is part of, I think, the OpenSSF project. Uh, there might be other sources of information. I, I don't know um, a lot of details about it, but those analyses have to be run periodically because the information gets updated. Okay, the build service uh, will take that toolchain container and uh, links to repositories on that Git host, and those are your only inputs to the build system. Everything has to be run offline. Um, no, no network access beyond those inputs. Uh, so even if you have uh, the, the digests for the software that you depend on that you would download and check digests for, that is verboten. So you do have to vendor all of your sources because we don't want to be in a situation where we are depending on a third party to, to host the code that we are, are using. So it has to be pulled in, put onto the Git, Git host that we manage internally. All right. Now, for our UFI specifically, um, we have a, a long qualification process. And a lot of uh, builds are thrown out as we are um, periodically building things, but not necessarily taking those builds as the next uh, cut that we're going to try to do. Um, and I don't think it's particularly useful to publish binaries that were, are not going to be used in production. So I'm keeping back the firmwares that, um, that we sign until the firmware is qualified. And that is when um, I, I published the, the binary of the firmware and the, the signed reference values for it. OK, now, in terms of Dan's question for, for having access to the sources, the build attestation that a build service will provide uh, has the salsa provenance that you can then, as a, an extra step, verify against all of the, the inputs to the build. And that extra step where you said that I have verified that is an endorsement. And that is a, um, a piece that you have to trust, but it at least gives you some inference power that, uh, yes, this is, is following good build hygiene. Um, so Salsa is not just about having access to, to sources and running offline, but it is also uh, an attestation from an organization that they have the, the, secu the operational security required to isolate the build service, lots of, uh, of things like that, okay? Um, so I would expect to see only the, the producers of these binaries to be the ones that are publishing the, the verified summary attestations. Uh, but you are not precluded from, from doing that yourself and signing your own summary attestations uh, and then requiring in your attestation policy, oh, I want it to be both verified by myself and from um, the supply chain provider. Uh, but that, that is a policy decision, okay? All right, so why have I been doing this for five years and not have something? Uh, the compute engine, uh, I've talked about the, the release, how the firmware is bundled. Um, I've had to carefully extricate uh, the, the two megabyte firmware from the 700 megabyte uh, VMM. Um, it is now separate and, and signed and, and uh, on its own uh, signing infrastructure. Um, the virtual firmware, uh, as I said, is in the mono repo. I have to get that team to move over to the GitHub host. There is a completely different uh, code review system. Uh, Garrett is the open source project for code review. 
uh, they would be switching over to that. They're on board with the idea, just don't have the, the resources to do the transition themselves. So it's up to me. The supply chain integrity stuff. Um, I would like to see reference values that are signed for, for runtime attestation being included into the entire um, production ecosystem once runtime attestations are used in use everywhere. Uh, and for that, I need to get our internal supply chain people on board with formats. I haven't done that yet. Uh, they've been pretty hands off, but I think uh, for the time being, we're gonna be targeting the, the SIG store uh, situation if that, so everything that I've been publishing has just been to a, uh, a bucket in cloud storage and um, making everything else enterprise scale is the challenge that uh, is left for future work. There we go. Assured open source is a new newer offering. Um, when we are trying to do this uh, same transparent release process for SVSM, SVSM uses the Rust tool chain. Rust is not one of the, the managed tool chain uh, offerings for assured open source, but they do have plans uh, to, to bring it. But uh, the build system is allowed to say, I am a salsa build, even though the tool chain, uh, salsa, salsa level three, even if the tool chain is not salsa level three because it's content addressable. So we can still download uh, things from the network to build the tool chain container, which is what I'm doing to build the, the Rust tool chain container at the moment. Um, but for for UA, UEFI, we're going to need, uh, or I would like to, to target the, the sources that are managed on that, that uh, Debian mirror, okay. All right, the combination of the, the tool chain container and the sources has to be run in a build service. This build service is not the same one that is used uh, for Google 3, the mono repo. And uh, there have been uh, efforts to uh, solidify that into a, a much better offering. Uh, it is there, um, but it is still uh, fairly new. So this is this new service is the only other service that's allowed to sign binaries as uh, good for production. So this is where we go from uh, GitHub Actions to uh, binaries that are produced that are visibly visible externally and usable internally according to the, the, the company security policies. All right, so that's that's a big one. All right. We're not going to take contributions uh, to our fork of EDK2 um, because we control the the virtual machine monitor, the ABR is ours to control, um, but we are going to make it viewable. Um, so I don't consider that open source. Uh, so it's published, okay? Um, there are changes that we make. So all of our crypto is not from like the, the Debian package of OpenSSL. We use boring SSL, it's just stripped down and managed by Googlers um, and is not depended on by EDK2 because the documentation says don't depend on us. Um, but we, we've talked to the EDK2 uh, maintainers and they uh, are okay with us being the maintainers of that connection. Uh, it's just a, a matter of prioritizing that work. I think that for the time being, not everything is going to be upstreamed, but there is plenty that is upstreamable. Um, it's desirable to make sure that there is a small enough delta uh, between our fork and upstream that um, there's little cause for being dubious of what we're providing. All right. 
So because we use boring SSL and because of decisions about PKS7, uh, authentic code has to be done in a different way and to be uh, a little bit more expedient about getting secure boot uh, supported before uh, confidential computing was in, in the mix, um, the security model changed. We moved that to the VMM. Right? The authentic code check is done in the VMM. We need to move that back in. That work is being done. So yes, we'd like to push things upstream. Um, the firmware team is small. Uh, I'm trying to to help them out with uh, all of the infrastructure. Uh, this, it, it takes some time, but it's happening. All right. What about publishing code when you're not allowed to publish code? Uh, we won't. And that is just kind of a, a tough situation. And it's why I'm very strong about separating the notion of signed reference value and an endorsement of transparency. They are different things. If we have uh, changes that we have to push out uh, to, to solve security problems, uh, we will still sign the reference value. It'll be opaque but it will still be authentic. Um, it will not come with, you're also able to, um, to verify the build. Um, and you, you could think about a, a way to do some kind of trusted time encryption thingy to have a Ulysses pack to make sure that all of the, the changes become public, uh, past the embargo um, publication date, but I don't want to. I don't want to deal with the legal implications of that, right? Okay. So, continuing on with the 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 sliding scale of transparency, uh, and why I don't think that just SIG store is enough. I talked about how when you launch a VM, you get firmware du jour. That doesn't particularly help when you do want the firmware measurement to be part of. PCR zero, um, and you say, okay, I have some some TPA things. I want to shut down for a bit and come back up. Uh, that is considered a new machine. You get a new firmware. The measurement changes. Oops. So it is going to have to become like a, an API option for folks to to include. PCR zero changes, because that is it is changing the, the expectation. Uh, we have to change the way that we deliver firmware binaries. They can't just be bundled in. Um, we have so that you can uh, pin to specific versions and say, oh, you know, I know that uh, I trust this particular version. It's available for a couple years. Let's stick to that one until we really do need to, to move on. Um, that work hasn't been done. Uh, I think it's very important that new releases are published ahead of time to give people heads up that a new firmware is coming uh, down the line, a new default, uh, so that people can upgrade after vetting. And that requires a, a publication channel. Like what, how do we tell people? Um, other than posting to a website that folks would then have to scrape. Uh, no, um, I think that there are better options such as pub sub systems. And I've written about that. So here is uh, a link I've put in chat about reference values, uh, man maintaining the life cycle of those reference values and how you can make sure that people have access to reference values ahead of actually trying to establish uh, an, an attestation um, handshake. Okay. Uh, the agenda said that I'd be talking about reproducible uh, UFI. I hadn't talked about reproducibility just yet because the UFI is not reproducible upstream with the Stuart build uh, 
builds system that is there. We use Blaze internally, Bazel as the open source project. Um, it has a, a fair amount of, of build macros that allow us to say we're building this specifically in the specific way that the binary is, is deterministic uh, internally. But in order to reduce the delta, I would like for our, our fork uh, upstream to use Stuart build. Uh, and that means contributing changes to EDK2 that uh, stabilize um, the, the bits. And that work hasn't been done. Uh, I know a wizard that says he has some ideas on how to, to manage things, but there are, there are bits that, that change every, every build for EDK2. It's kind of annoying. And it kind of leads into the problem. There's not a general way to have reproducible builds. And if we want everybody to be able to have good trust in the, uh, the bits that are running in confidential, contain or confidential uh, environments, then how do we get around that reproducible problem, right? There is an effort from an Intel researcher and other folks in the Intoto uh, project to cr create a new level of build attestation uh, assurance. So beyond L3, where you say, okay, everything is hermetic, it's offline, it is in an isolated protected uh, node, you also are going to say that this is a build that is in a trusted execution environment and uh, it produces an attestation that it uh, is in that environment. And uh, my expectation for this new system is that you would provision a key for that level of build uh, within an attested key brokerage service so that you only release the key to the build service that is running in the trusted execution environment. Um, the Attestation that you save uh, for the bill for later uh, offline checking um, has to include the, the inputs and outputs of the build so that you don't need to have a, uh, a proof of freshness for that attestation because everything is already done. There is, there is no replay attack uh, when, you, when you combine everything after uh, the, the build is, is complete. Um, but in order to kind of bootstrap your, your, your idea of what is a trustworthy binary um, that you go from inputs to the, the bits that are attested as the reference values, um, you can either go turtles all the way down and say, okay, the past three uh, different build services have built themselves and uh, have attested themselves, or we make sure that all of the, the inputs to that build system are themselves deterministic and reproducible so that you can kind of ground your truth just in the trustworthy build system. Um, either way, uh, one is more difficult than the other. Uh, and I imagine that we'll, we'll have one before the other. Um, but I am not one of the people on the build service team. Uh, it'll, it'll take custo customer demand to, to push those requirements through to the, the engineers. But I think we're, we're all pr similarly on the same page of what is ideal. Um, and the launcher that isolates the build within the TEE is something that's built in by by Google. You'd have to trust it. And I don't know if that is something that they will be publishing. Um, I'm not sure if that, that thing is uh, behind some, uh, some kind of trade secret thing, but I don't think so, uh, but it, that's not my call. Um, but we could get to a point where you know, uh, 
through NDAs with uh, a certifying third party, we could get it um, at least endorsed by a third party that it is doing its job. Uh, and that could be good enough for a fair number of, of people that would use the build service. Okay, Dan, you have a question. Yeah, I was just thinking to one of the topics we kicked off with today was the the desire to get some of these important use cases like uh, software supply chain reflected mm -hmm. in the CCC portfolio. Uh, and I wonder kind of connecting what, what you've referenced here with what Marcella has been looking at and what you've been looking at, whether there could be a, a project that comes out of that that we could host in the CCC and demonstrate the ability to protect some aspect or the entirety of the build of a build chain with yeah. confidential computing. So there are um, two open build projects, or there's the open build uh, service uh, that I think Sue started and is now its own project, produces uh, salsa provenances. It could be one of the, the places where the, the build workers are running in a TEE. I'm not part of that project, but that is um, a, a, a reasonable next step for that. Uh, Red Hat uh, published their own transparent supply, or not transparent, uh, trustworthy tr supply chain offering that also produces all the provenances. Uh, I saw an article on April 18th, something like that, uh, about this, this new project. So I think there are plenty of opportunities for build services to provide this level of assurance, which is why it's being worked into the standard. Um, and the researcher is at Intel and not Google. So yes, uh, I don't know which project would be the, the best one to onboard who, who is closest to confidential computing. Um, but yes, very, very good uh, uh, comment. So I, I saw a, a uh, talk by Intel and uh, someone, I think Microsoft, OSS North America on salsa stuff, uh, where they're talking about TEs specifically. Uh, they're using TEs rather than building for TEs, but that might be relevant. I don't know. I had a couple of questions as well, mm -hmm. if, I, if you're done, Dan. Yeah, yeah, I thought. Uh, yeah, so here's my summary. Uh, so oh, yes, what do you? What was your? What, what's your question? No, no, finish this off, and I'll. I'll yeah, it, it yeah. Can so, in. yeah. So I talked about the different quality of, of of transparency that is is not just the build attestation on some blockchain thing. Uh, don't think that blockchain makes things more trustworthy. Um, I do think that it's important for other organizations to uh, own their own trust by producing their own verified summary attestations uh, and then include those in their, their uh, attestation policy. Um, try to push for the highest level of build assurance with salsa levels. And then when you have your signed reference values, make them available to other services that are trying to make sure that folks have access to the supply chain. Supply chain is particularly hard to centralize. Uh, and I know that uh, Intel Trust Authority does not want to be in the business of, of uh, hosting all of the signed reference values. So when you get a, a ref, uh, an attestation result, it is pretty much the quote translated back to you in JSON after it's checked that the certificates go back to Intel. Um, I think that you need a little bit more work done in a verification service to connect with the, the supply chain. And when you are talking about reselling confidential com uh, computing technologies, it can't just be Google saying, here is the firmware, uh, or Sue saying, here is the, the disk image that you started the VM from, it is also the operators that are saying, here is uh, the, the, the build attestation for the launcher, and here is the build attestation for the application. There's 
plenty of things there that need to be brought online and made accessible to a variety of, of verification services. And I think that uh, PubSub uh, is, is an appropriate way to, to communicate uh, in bulk what are uh, new binaries that are coming online, signed reference values to different uh, members of the Federation that are trying to pro provide software uh, supply chain integrity information to the, the broader ecosystem of attestation verifiers, right? So PubSub with gRPC, PubSub with ActivityPub, it doesn't particularly matter so long as we are discussing what are the pathways that are, we're, we're talking to each other how are we expecting to go from publication subscription to operational decisions? Um, like I said, if we, we publish a new firmware, you wanna to be told about it, check things out and then change your policy to say, uh, I, I want to trust this new firmware. Uh, say I've produced a, a VSA for it and now I trust it. Um, yeah, that's, that's my soapbox there. So, Mike, you had a question. Yeah, I got it. So, firstly, thank you so much for this. This is a the sort of work's really important to be being done, but also from my from my point of view, exactly what this consortium is for on the on at least the tax side, right? This is where we should be sharing the stuff, uh, and it's just brilliant. So, thank you so much. Please uh, give us a copy of these slides so that we can host them somewhere if that's okay. Uh, all those sorts of things. So, I had some 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 general questions and a very specific question. So the general questions are kind of lead on a bit from what Dan said is how can the community help? I mean, either in terms of, um, you know, open source contributions to various projects or um, pressure directly from member companies or asking their customers, member co companies, customers to, you know, exert pressure on, on, in what direction. So that's my first set of questions. If you want to maybe answer that, I'll, then you've got another one. Um, I think that it's for us to, to make uh, our UFI transparent in the ways that I'm talking about, it is a, a lot of enterprise hurdles to, to jump over. I don't know what folks are going to need in order to start using these more open build services that provide attestations. Um, if folks are using particular build uh, services, it'd be interesting to, to learn what level of assurance they're going for. Um, I know cloud build is working towards having higher salsa levels. Um, I think that reference values in particular are tricky. Uh, I've been working with the CoRIM working group on formats for providing reference values, and they are uh, focused very heavily on, on the firmware of hardware because they're, they're at that level. When you're talking about um, slices of the, the PCR bank that are combinations of software from different principles, that is where it gets tricky to express what your expected PCRs are, because then it becomes policy about composition and not uh, reference values of digests. And um, I know Keylime has policy in terms of an embedded DSL in Python, but if we can come together and uh, try to specify a, uh, a data language that can be run in verifiers uh, to express reference values of more complicated systems, um, specifically the, the, the gap between firmware and workload. Like the Whimsy uh, working group is trying to get to workload. CoRIM is working from firmware. I think for uh, folks who are creating the VM disk images, um, getting to the packaging process uh, so that we can say, okay, here is 
how we're producing a, tr um, a, a measured boot integrity protected reference value chain. That is, that is uh, a conversation um, that I, I'd really like to, to have with, with folks. I promised you a, a document on what I, uh, what specifically that could look like. It is, I've, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm trained as a programming language researcher. So I started modeling Key Lime's policy as a programming language. So that's where I got stuck. <laughs> uh, so that that's that's where I am, York. Um, but I think that if if we can start talking more about uh, reference values more as subterrain complete programs. Um, that would be uh, an interesting place to go. Uh, I, I think that the, the open policy engine is itself um, executing on a reference value where your reference value is a, is a policy on composing reference values. And I don't see that there's a particular gap between those things um, philosophically. So, okay. Now that that's yeah. there's lots of stuff there. Okay. So my my other question was, um, not everybody wants to consume a a bootable VM in the way that you're talking about. Some people just want a, a vCPU and and memory pages, like right? the NARCS model, where you know you build your own stuff and you or you manage all your own syscalls and stuff. How easy is that with Google? And also. Uh, and that may be a, that may be an unfair question for you, but I do. Do you see what I mean? If if you don't want firmware, how easy is it to consume that on in, in the Google model? And and do you do you think that's going to continue to be easy or hard? Or again, may, maybe not your your area of interest. Yeah. So there are there are folks who would say that. You know, you can bring your own image that brings its own uh, support problems um, because Definitely. interacting with the platform is annoying and now costs money to, to answer people's questions. When you take a, a firmware team that is, is small and uh, having a hard time keeping up with demands already and saying, okay, let's, let's open up this to anybody can, uh, can come bring their own firmware. Um, and you have access to Fuzz, the virtual mem uh, machine monitor. Uh, remember, Google Cloud is a has a Type Two uh, VM uh, situation. It's not Type One like uh, Azure. So there, there's considerable more software uh, uh, bet between. The, okay, so it sounds like a, a bigger yeah. question for another time. But th thank you yeah. very much indeed. And uh, I'll leave the, uh, anyone else has any questions. Thank you so much, Dion. Dion, I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. This has been such a fantastic topic and so closely related well, to what we were kicking off with. So we'll, we'll give Hank the last question here and then free <laughs> Diana up. And then we've got a couple more topics to squeeze in before the end of the hour. Go ahead, so Hank. actually, um, actually, this is not a question, but it's more like a closing remark. Then um, I want to congratulate Diona on dancing on so many red lines that intersect here. Mm -hmm. That is really not really, really not easy. So I, I, I've, I've known Diana for a few months now. I know how she contributes and it's and how her uh, thoughts are, are very clear and how she can exasperate on. Wow, this is. Why is this so conflicting sometimes? But I think we are on a, on a good road here. And I, I have to compliment again, Diana, on, 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 on keeping track and not giving up. As she said, why do I don't have anything here at this table? It was very, very illustrative. It really shows how this is a little bit difficult. Um, and uh, I think, especially when we want this uh, trail of uh, endorsement and reference values and how to make them available in a feasible way so that we are not disclosing things, so that we don't have to... Uh, email them and click emails because of uh, triple NDA things and such. So that would be really nice. And I think uh, we are getting there step by step. So uh, 
Um, I will I will show this recording and the slide deck to other people involved in the rats and all you know the transparency stuff and maybe we can find more pieces here, especially because six stores already um, that their base is kind of grows towards other transparency service solutions from the IETF and actually there's a lot of synergy there and I think we can make this uh, this availability transparency stuff. Uh, really work um so yeah this is basically my closing remarks and i would again thank you for for keeping up and and doing this and i don't think i can do a better job of uh expressing appreciation than that so um we've got similar groups at intel and and others in the open source community that i, I hope to point to this recording as well and i, I hope it's the uh, continuation of a, a number of related discussions that we have here. Yash, I'll, I'll let you squeeze yeah. in here quickly. So I, I, we we actually could have a, a inside portion on the six source side because Lily is going to go work from the CCC. She's going to go work on six store now. Oh. So this could be a very good uh, intersection to get Lily pulled in into this discussion. Cool. Six store is not meant for online uh, that, yeah, okay. re reference value checks. So I think that a perhaps a managed uh, Archivista uh, instance is a bit more, um, a, a bit closer to what we would need because you can establish a, a key uh, that is the digest that you will see in measurement that will allow you to fetch the, the certificate for that value, right? Um, it is uh, a challenge to, to determine like how much of the, the fire hose you want to, to open up because uh, you could have many, many, many people going and publishing their own VSAs for the same firmware because, hey, uh, Google published this thing uh, but I want to be be sure of my own, and let me just establish my own VS, VSA in the uh, RIM service. So we would we've, we've been calling the the software supply chain value provider thing uh, uh, a RIM service. I think Nvidia also has a RIM service, um, but yeah, my my hope is to to allow these things to be more federated. Um, yeah, so yes, Archivista is, a, is, a, is one. Um, but really the, the database uh, part of it is, is part of the API that we, we do need to, to figure out because the application is different. Okay. All right, well, um, we will have to leave it on that note. We've got a few other things to hit here. So uh, one last time, thanks again, Diana. Really enjoyed it. And uh, I'll be trying to circulate this as well as I can.